Hi everyone. Hey guys. So my name is Hanif Cassis, and I will be presenting over the next probably less than 20 minutes. I won't take up too much of your time. Uh, just a, a brief history and synopsis of the ad block phenomena that's uh, taking the industry by storm, and what the future of uh, digital advertising uh, may or should look like. But before I really dive deep, I just want to thank you guys for coming. I know there's a lot of slamming out there, a lot of wheeling and dealing, and I really do appreciate the time that you are taking out of your, your day, uh, very limited resource time, but you're coming and spending some time with me, so I really appreciate it. Um, just by a show of hands, uh, I told a couple people in the audience, I would ask this, what, who stands to benefit from that in this room? Okay, so everyone else, Stands, if you stand to, to have a negative impact on your business, just by a show of hands. And who is here just out of simple curiosity? Okay, that's a good, good crowd. So I hope you guys get some benefit from this. Um, so a quick introduction. This is found, uh, this presentation at fastpayads.com. That is our blog. Um, so you can read about it there. And as I mentioned, my name is Hanukkah Assis. A lot of people think I'm a girl. Because uh, of my, my name, you guys are probably expecting that. Uh, and I, I work for a company, uh, my company is called Forex Capital Markets. And the reason I'm here is because we share the same risks as publishers. Anyone that stands to, to be harmed from ad block technology, um, we share those risks as well because my business finances web publishers by advancing funds against unpaid ad receivables to help them scale their content promotion. So the risks that publishers face are largely the risks that we face. So we've been following ad block very closely, and it does stand as an existential threat to what we are doing as well. And you can find us this weekend on our Twitter handle, at ForexCM. Feel free to tweet us questions and engage, and if you'd like to meet up afterward, I'm more than happy to do that. So a quick history lesson. Um, ad block originated in Germany in 2006. And this is, this is a map of the earth. Um, as it might be from outer space. So, Adblock originated there in Germany. We're located in Cleveland, Ohio. That's where our headquarters is at. And we are here in Las Vegas, Nevada. So, in the first seven years of Adblock, it was really just a slow and steady growth. Many major players in the industry didn't think much of it. Even Google turned a blind eye. They didn't think that would really be a, uh, anything that would majorly impact their business. And many equated it to um, global warming, just a slow and steady death, if any at all, and not so much an existential threat like a meteor or killing all the dinosaurs. But what's happened in the last couple of years is just an explosive growth, or what some are referring to as critical mass, which is basically, it's gone viral. There's so many people that have ad block right now that they're telling their friends and, and with the, 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 the advent of new ad types that are really hindering the user experience. It's just growing at a rapid clip. So how rapidly is it growing? What's the impact on the present day? Well, as of the end of June, uh, I'm sure many of you have probably read the, the Page Fair Adobe report. They put out an annual report about ad block every year. As of the end of June, there were 198 million monthly active users across the entire globe. With the majority of that in Europe, there's about 45 million monthly active users in the US. And it's estimated to cost those publishers in the US $20.3 billion. Last year, it cost Google $6.7 billion. So it's largely the 80 20 rule, where very few publishers are going to bear the majority of, of the actual cost. But it, it will inevitably affect publishers in the lower market. It will affect everyone because the effect is relative, really. And it's growing at an annual growth rate of 41%. So the report came out six months ago, back of napkin. 41% a year, you're looking at probably monthly active users now, 240 million um, uh, in the very near months. And where, where are they coming from? Well, the vehicles that are being used for ad block, 98% as of the end of June last year were browsers, with the majority of that coming from Google Chrome. And you're probably thinking, okay, Google's the biggest ad network. Isn't that ironic that their browser, Chrome, is the number one vehicle for ad block technology. But Google has prided itself on, on the fact that they're, they're after uh, 
environment where it's user choice. So Google basically says, despite it costing them $6.7 billion, Google actually says, look, if you guys want to download our browser because it's lightweight, fast, whatever, that's your choice. If you want to put an add-on that will hinder our revenue, that's your choice. So you really have to admire Google for, for their stance on this because they could, what they could do is just say that Adblock, no, you can't have, you can't have a plugin on our Chrome extension. And it would and overnight flip on the switch, create more revenue for Google, or bring back cost revenue. So I thought that was interesting. Um, 48 million come from Firefox, and the Safari has about 9 million. That's probably going to change with um, the advent of Safari now integrating ad, ad block technology directly into the browser with iOS and iPhone. So what about mobile? Well, last year, 18 months ago or so, Google came up with what was called mobile edit and how the mobile landscape will affect you as a publisher in terms of SEO, optimization, conversions. So that's becoming a bigger concern. Uh, but mobile, right as of the end of June, I say right now, it's really as of, as of a page fair at Adobe Report, comprising of 2% of ad block pack. 38% of all internet browsing comes from mobile. But now that Apple Safari has integrated Adblock, and as of just a few weeks ago, not even a month ago, Asus, computer and tablet manufacturer, struck a deal with Adblock to put it in all their products from the outset. So that's another catalyst that's going to lead to uh, mobile capturing 50% of the Adblock market by the end of 2016. So by the end of this year, it will be 50% desktop and 50% mobile. So the main driver is Apple Safari, Asus integrating. But one thing that's really overlooked, it's not just an integration of Safari. There's this long-standing war between Google and Apple. I'm sure many of you follow if you're a business insider, TechCrunch, things like that. So basically, Google's the largest ad network. 90% of their, their revenue for last year was $596 billion comes from advertisements. And by integrating this, by Apple integrating this ad block into Safari, it's really just taking a big blow. It's creating an existential threat to Google. And Google also has $11 billion from search alone in revenue a year. $9 billion of that last year came from iOS. So the majority of their search revenue comes from iOS products. So that's another reason Apple would want to take out Google. And Apple's also rolled out with iAd, which is a, it's a small ad network, but what it does is allow app developers to integrate ad placements into their, into their apps. So that's a third reason that there's just this huge battle between um, Apple and Google and what it's created is a collateral effect on publishers. It's not like Apple wants to take out publishers and free media. They're going after Google and the ancillary effect is that publishers are the ones that are being harmed. And then the, the, the rise of these interstitial ads like on Forbes.com, when you go to Forbes, it has the quote of the day and it like walks you in there and in the upper right hand corner, you can click skip this ad, or a locked pre roll where you go to a website and you're forced to watch a commercial for Kleenex or GMC trucks. After like 10 seconds, you can click skip this video. So, those types of ads really hinder the UX of, of uh, uh, browsing on the internet, and that has created an increase in demand for ad block technology. And then, as I mentioned before, is just the critical mass. It's really just gone viral, just like any other growth chart. It was trending along, trending along, and now it's hit its critical mass as of like two years ago. So what can be done about this? Like who, who's out there battling this right now? Well, there's tech initiatives, there's industry-wide initiatives, and I, I think there's a legal collective, a, a possible collective legal attack on ad block technology. So as for the, the tech initiatives, there's what's called ad block block technology. So simply put, ad block technology blocks cookies, tracking devices, ads, and malware from your experience browsing on the internet. When I pick up my iPhone and I go to my client's websites, there's no ads on it. And that's, that's not a good thing, considering many of them are optimized for mobile. But it's just a simple technology that blocks ads. Ad block block does the opposite. It circumvents the ad. So there's, it's becoming a crowded space, but some major players in the industry, one is like Block IQ, and what they do is they display a message. Um, I haven't seen it personally, and the message does not appear on BlockIQ.com, but I would imagine it's something along the lines of, hey, we're providing this content to you for free, and the way we do that is through advertising. So if you could please turn off your ad, 
blocker not being greatly appreciated. Page there, Adobe found that that works less than 1% of the time, but it's an extra tool. Um, then they have what's called block bypass, which actually protects the content, and Forbes actually did this just a couple weeks ago. I don't know if they were using block IQ or not, but what Forbes did was they basically said, you can't read this content until you remove or turn off your ad block technology. So a lot of users did that to read the Forbes articles, and what it did was it served malware to them. So it was a terrible, terrible side effect to the ad block block technology. And then um, the third thing is that the technology simply turns off or circumvents the ad block uh, plugin extension. Uh, SourcePoint, very similar, former Google executive, he just raised $10 million last year. He does uh, something similar, uh, immediately displays a message detailing the importance of free media, free content. We, we are able to subsidize that with advertisements. Um, he also has a, a, tech, a, a tech portion that completely circumvents the ad block. But then an, an interesting third option is that the user gets to choose the experience. The user gets to say, uh, okay, I'll do one article for one ad, or two articles for two ads, or three articles for three ads. So it's up to the user to choose. Uh, but those are some initiatives. We just met with a company called Red Defender. They're here. If you get a chance to meet them, uh, they're probably a great idea. What they do is interesting. They circumvent the technology by filling it with ads from another network. So they're an ad network that kind of like fills the void after Adblock has eliminated ads from the page. So what are the industry initiatives? Well, the Interactive Advertising Bureau is heading up the initiative. And although it's unspoken, I think it's understood that Google was probably bankroll with them. And what they're doing is coming up with a tech app, which is, as they always have, new guidelines and standards to make ads less intrusive, uh, detection and post-detection so that they, publishers can detect with, their, with the technology um, whether their ads are being blocked, and post-detection, okay, your ads are being blocked, who is blocking them? Where are they coming from? What's the demographic? What tools are they using? How can you work around it? And then the overall goal is that it's a better UX solution. So where do we see the market headed? Well, I think ultimately the rise of native advertising is really what's going to be um, uh, the norm in the future. But there's going to be a lot of legal battles before we get there. And as we've seen in Germany, uh, I can't recall the name of the major ad network, but it was a huge lawsuit against Adblock last year, maybe 20, end of 2014. And they basically said this is anti-competitive because you are blocking our advertising revenue stream. That is, that is our bread and butter. That's how we make our money. This is anti-competitive. You can't do that. It wasn't upheld. The German court ruled in favor of Adblock. Um, I don't know what, if that argument would have any uh, weight in America, in American court. It may or may not. I don't know if anyone's tried it. I don't think they have. Other arguments are fair use and exchange. Fair use and exchange is the idea that hey, ideas are free. Ideas are communicated for free via the internet. Advertisements are, broadly speaking, a type of idea. And you can't interfere with this fair use and exchange uh, by blocking these ads. Another one is free speech and expression on both sides. The publisher, if, think about it like you have digital property. Think about it like real property. I can put a sign in my yard for anything I want. So in that regard, I have a piece of property I can express, I can choose to associate with this advertising company, put this ad on my website. And from the advertiser's perspective, advertising is free speech, as long as it's not misleading and false. So if they agree that they want to uh, advertise on this website and the publisher wants to put it on there, you know, there's that's like a violation of free speech if you're going to be blocking the ads that come about from that relationship. Which leads to what I think could be the biggest legal argument for the industry, and that's tortious interference and extortion. Tortious interference is a tort. It's basically a wrongdoing, knowing wrongdoing. And interference is exactly what it says. You are, in a, in a wrongful way, interfering with a contract. The contract between the ad networks and publishers. It's a quid pro quo deal, this for that, where the ad network say, in exchange for your real estate, we're going to pay you money. And the publisher says, in exchange for my real estate, you know, I'm going to give you traffic for your advertisers. And there, that is a legally binding contract where both parties must perform. Adblock essentially prohibits the publisher from performing its duty underneath the contract that it has with the ad network. So that could be tortious interference. 
And then the last one is extortion, which is basically holding someone hostage to get what you want out of them, uh, it, it, usually by monetary means. The head of the IAB, I know you guys can read, but uh, they said basically ad block is an extortionist. I only say that because I hate when people read the slides, uh, the words that are on the slides, because you guys can do that. But it basically said, quote, ad block is an extortionist scheme that risks distorting the economics of democratic capitalism. And I probably had to read it once or twice before I knew exactly what that meant. But just to put it into perspective, last month, there was what's called Camp David NYC, and named after the president's retreat where he tries to broker peace deals. Camp David NYC was called by Adblock, and they said, uh, we want the 20 biggest publishers, ad networks, exchanges, stakeholders to come to uh, a hotel in New York, and let's talk about what a, a fair middle ground is. Like, what's a good middle ground where we can have an internet with less intrusive ads and everyone's happy? And the CEO of Digital Content Next refused to go because while he appreciated the opportunity to share his input, he didn't like the fact that Adblock is making money off of publishers. By cre they've created this whitelist. So the idea is that at um, Camp David NYC, they had what's called the Acceptable Ads Committee, which will eventually be rolled off into a nonprofit, and it's going to be comprised of major players in the space that come up with guidelines for what's called acceptable ads. If you get on adblock.org, you can find and read about what an acceptable ad is. Um, so basically, they come up with the standards for acceptable ad. Publishers that follow this acceptable ad standard can get what's called white visit. So this is kind of like an initiative, like what the IAB is doing with standards and guidelines. But it's extortion in a way because they're saying, you pay us, we'll show the ads. And you make the whitelist by um, paying ad block. And if the increase in your ad impressions is 10 million or more, you get on the whitelist and the ad block takes 30% of that. Business Insider has an article a couple months ago came out. Google, Amazon, and uh, Microsoft have paid billions already to ad block, but they won't reveal who else is paying to them, which is kind of uh, frowned upon by many major players in the industry. So in the next uh, one to five years, what are we going to see? We're going to see more extortion. I think Adblock has said we don't plan on going down the market, but I think they're going to go after publishers of your size. Why wouldn't they? And then there's going to be services that track the ROI. Is it worth it for me to pay Adblock and gener am I generating an ROI from the ad that, that appear and the ad revenue that's generated? Or am I not? It might just be in the publisher's best interest to not even pay Adblock if the return isn't there. So there's going to be services that pop up that start to facilitate that process. And then there's going to be new revenue streams and advertisements and the legal battles that I discussed. And then we'll see the continuing legal battles until one of those major tortious interference or extortion cases really just disrupts ad block as we know it, which will continue to provide free media for the internet and less intrusive ads like native advertising and sponsored ads will be the norm. So right now we have a rise, a battle, and a fall. That's that's inevitable. There's, there's got to be some, some <coughs> end result. And that's my prediction. I clearly am biased because I like the space that I'm in and I don't want to see internet advertising go away. But what can you do as a publisher in the meantime while this battle is going on? You can do a couple things. Um, follow those guidelines because you never know uh, whether you're compliant or not until you actually get on the website, follow the guidelines, make sure you're compliant because it, it, it may save you some. Another one is to start looking toward native advertising because it's less intrusive. Start adding sponsored posts instead of straight up display ads. And the third one is if you're promoting your content, promote your content to companies like Taboola, Outbrain, Content.ad, RevContent, because if your ad is on another website and someone clicks on it, you know they don't have ad block up because they saw your ad, and then that way you can get the CPMs from the ads that are on your website. And when you're looking to scale, uh, definitely please keep us in mind. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to tweet us or uh, give us a call or email. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> any, uh, any questions?
That's a, that's a good question. So basically the question is how is this, like, there has been an exist, uh, in the past third parties that have been blocked from communicating. Like, for example, she said that CEO's administrative assistant will uh, remove junk mail or on the do not call list. The main difference is the property. There's no tangible property that's actually present that takes up space with a do not call list and with uh, a CEO's administrative assistant removing junk mail. But with a website, there's a property. There's actually property rights involved where if I'm a website owner and I choose to sell real estate on my website, I have a right to make that money. And if an advertising company, as long as they're not misleading or false, chooses to put an ad on the website, that's their right. So there's that legally binding contract between them. I think the major, I, I do see the comparison in what you asked, but I think the major distinction is that there's property rights involved. Yeah, so um, you're saying ad block, block technology tends to slow down the website. Yeah, and I think, I don't have personally any experience with it. I think that's just a product of the technology being new and uh, it just bogging down the overall experience. That's a good question. Anyone else? So the, the, the inquiry was, um, I, I see parallels between this and DVR. So DVR prevents advertisers from advertising on TV. It goes back to the property rights. Uh, like I don't own the property that's in between um, uh, my television screen, although it could be argued that uh, possibly the television company does. I, I don't know, I haven't really drawn that comparison before, but it's worth looking into. Uh, um, surely, solution, uh, I, I hear your discussion around the legal uh, position, but surely the solution here is to effectively listen to what two of the million plus people are saying, is that we want a better experience. I mean, Google have proved that people are willing to look at advertising online. You know, their billion dollars of revenue a year can prove that. What the user is saying is just show me something that's relevant. Not much. Don't, don't advertise to me when I don't want them to see it. By the way, I want to have some kind of sharing in the value that I'm creating online. Surely that's the answer. Not quite in this league, but actually find a middle ground and give users a better experience and let them share in some of the value that they're creating. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think the middle ground is probably going to be the end result. The legal battles I'm, I'm raising are what companies like uh, perhaps BuzzFeed major, major publishers where they're, they make so much money from advertising, they're not interested in the middle ground. I mean, I wouldn't be if I were them. But I do think the end result is that the IAB's guidelines will follow suit with ad block technology because they've essentially captured the market. They've created a monopoly in guidelines. And they can set the standard. But the problem is, users still have to turn off ad block. So even if you are compliant with ad block's requirements, it's up to the user to turn it off. So that's the issue. That's why the, I think the legal battles will continue. I'm sure they will, but I think when you're fighting the will against, you know, the, the, the will of the people is a hard thing to fight against. Right. I understand your concept of the property, but I would think that the publisher's property is what they are putting onto the web. But when it is displayed on my screen, that is my property. And I have the right to change it because what? my property on my screen, on my phone, that's a good argument. My so, how does that fit into the argument? Right. So that's a good question. It's basically he understands that the publisher's property is the website between the four corners of the screen, but when he's viewing his on his space, server space, it's his property. I would equate it to driving down the street. You're like you can see someone's yard, but it doesn't make it yours. So when you're browsing the internet, that's, those are individual owned, individually owned place card holders on the web. 
Um, I don't know enough about digital property rights um, to give you an answer, but that is an interesting uh, way to look at it. But I, I wouldn't imagine that just because I'm viewing someone's website, that's my property. The screen is my property, everything that's behind the screen is my property, but what's appearing on the screen is mine. It's like going into a club and you see whatever. And you yeah. Down in their environment. Think of it like in a physical way. It, um, I don't think it would be your property if it was physical. Well, websites have property listings. Yeah. They have a owner and it's a listing owner. Therefore, you are correct. They are considered property. Right. Well, right. So, so what her comment was is that uh, websites are property because they have property owners and it's listed under IP, intellectual property. And it's your, new, it's your newspaper. Yeah, I know. Well, that, this is great because this highlights exactly what issues face the digital economy, right? The legal economy. Not all these, not all these uh, issues are, have answers yet. So I'm just trying to give you some thought provocation uh, about where things could go, what the arguments could be, who may win, who will lose. But that, those are good points you brought up. The newspaper is not the newspaper, it's I yours. Put in my bird cage. Right, you can put in your bird cage. Okay, so now that's the content issue. Okay, I see that. I see that as well. I, I'm not. I'm not a digital. I'm not a, a property rights attorney. Uh, I'm licensed, but I'm not an attorney. I don't practice. Uh, so there are many issues that, that are out there that we just don't know the answer to. But it'll definitely be interesting to see um, how how it all plays out. And I think that's my time. So uh, thank you guys very much for coming.